So thank you all very much for coming out today to the, uh, the online mathematical physics seminar at Rutgers University. Today we have Tatsuya uh, Daniel speaking from Brown University on canonical quantization of gravity and the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. So without further ado, take it away. Okay, thank you uh, very much for the uh, introduction, Lawrence. Uh, so uh, I'm a third year uh, PhD student at Brown uh, University, uh, and my PhD advisor is uh, uh, Stefan Alexander. And um, I am going to be uh, giving uh, the first part of a uh, what's going to be a two talk series on, uh, on on work that that we have done and that we're still doing. Um, on a particular uh, formulation of quantum gravity. So the first part, uh, the first uh, talk that I'm giving today is going to be uh, more of an introduction into uh, the uh, this canonical quantization of gravity and uh, and the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. And uh, ultimately, uh, I'm going to be uh, building up to uh, uh, some work that my uh, that my PhD advisor and I did along with. Uh, a collaborator in the UK, uh, a paper that we uh, that we put out uh, over the summer uh, on this. Uh, so just a brief uh, overview of what I'm going to uh, talk about today. So I'm going to uh, start with just a, a, a review of uh, first and second quantization. Uh, then from there, I will uh, go into uh, talk about the canonical formulation of, uh, of general relativity. And uh, and then from there, I'll talk about the Wheeler-DeWitt equation and how that emerges from uh, uh, quant from quantizing uh, GR in this canonical formulation. Uh, and then from there, I'll talk about the, uh, the Ashtakar formalism and uh, how that simplifies the Wheeler DeWitt equation. Uh, and then uh, I will uh, conclude and uh, end with a preview of, of, of uh, next time, uh, the, the second talk that I'll be giving in the spring. Okay, so, uh, so first and second, second quantization. So, um, as I'm sure uh, most people in the audience, uh, you know, they've taken, uh, you've, you've all taken uh, quantum mechanics at some level. Uh, and so uh, you are probably uh, familiar with, with, with the story, or at least, you know, part, part, part of the story, or at least the big uh, picture of the story. So uh, quantum physics uh, first dealt uh, only with the, the quantization of the motion of, of particles. Uh, so this was, you know, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and Dirac. And uh, this first, this kind of, First way of when uh, when they were dealing with this uh, in the mid 1920s, this left the the, the electromagnetic field classical. Um, later, the electromagnetic field uh, was also quantized, so we can think of Dirac uh, a few years later, and uh, even the particles themselves uh, got represented by quantized uh, fields. So now we're going from not only a a classical, you know, we're not not only going from a classical to a quantum kind of many body. Kind of interpretation of particle interpretation of, of, of a theory but now the uh the particles themselves uh get represented by quantized fields uh so this was uh, also uh, this you know jordan and bigner and uh this uh, resulted in the development of uh, quantum electrodynamics so the uh you know quantizing electromagnetism as, as well as a uh, quantum field theory uh so the original form of quantum mechanics uh as it was first formulated uh, by Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and Dirac. This is known as first quantization. And the, the later formulation, uh, which is uh, how QFT is described, is known as second, second quantization. Uh, so this is uh, um, something that is uh, can be confusing in the name. Uh, second quantization, uh, it, it, kind of, it can seem that from the name, it implies that you are quantizing something a second time. Uh, really, the, the reason why it's called second quantization is because it's it was it was the second uh, it was really it was the second way of, of, uh, the, of formulating a quantum physics. Uh, so just like more, it's it's second. It's called second quantization because it was historically second, not because of the you know, quantizing a second time. Um, okay, so uh, just talking about first quantization. So uh, this is concerned with the calculating uh, physical observables from a microscopic description of, of a particular system. So this is something that you learn in, in, in quantum mechanics. So uh, we we have some Hamiltonian for for uh, you know for uh, for our system, and we can write it in terms of single particle single particle Hamiltonians, and we have some interaction potential uh, between uh, you know 
that uh, between our particles. And uh, the basic problem is the solution uh, is looking as, at, at the uh, at the dynamics of the uh, of, of the system. So looking at the uh, the Schrodinger equation, which uh, includes the 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 uh, the, the dynamics of our system. So the the basic problem is looking at uh, so when we do when we uh, do this quant when we do this quantization and then move to talking about particles, then we get this many particle Schrodinger equation. And so now the basic problem is, uh, you know, solving this 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 many particle Schrodinger equation. Uh, okay, so we can expand uh, psi. We can expand this wave function in a complete set of symmetrized or anti-symmetrized products of time-independent uh, single particle wave functions for bosons or fermions, respectively. So. Um, this is something that that you uh, you uh, probably if you've taken uh, quantum mechanics, definitely if you've taken quantum field theory but even if, they, if you've only taken you know some level of quantum mechanics you will you will you will have come across this where you write you write psi as uh you know you can write it as depending on if it's bosons or bosons or fermions you can uh you know you can write it as uh some combination of single particle wave functions and sometimes you know the determinant uh you, you can uh, think of like the uh like you can think of basically like a determinant of uh the, the expression becomes kind of like a determinant or some kind of variant of that um depending on if you're looking at both sides or fermions. Yeah. so this is something that you you may have uh, encountered in your in, uh, in your classes uh or it, you know uh, and I'm, I'm talking mainly to the to the uh the undergrads uh primarily in, in the audience here or you know younger students uh but anyway so a direct solution of the schrodinger equation uh is not so in just this language of first quantization, a direct solution of the Schrodinger equation is, is uh, it's, it's uh, not practical. And uh, it's necessary to apply other techniques, uh, as we will see, uh, namely second quantization and quantum field theory. Okay, so now when we, when we go to second quantization, uh, so this kind of uh, process of expanding psi in this like set of symmetrized or anti-symmetrized uh, products, uh, is not necessary. You don't need to do that. The boson or, uh, or fermion statistics are already accounted for. Um, so in second quantization, uh, what we do is we use a quantum mechanical basis that describes the number of particles occupying each state in a complete set of uh, single particle states. Uh, so we're going to uh, introduce uh, this time independent state vector, uh, you know, n1, n2, uh, and so on, um, where the n ones and n n twos, etc. They describe, uh, you know, th that that's the number. Th those are the number of, of, of particles uh, in state one, state two, and so on and so forth. And the, the sum of all of all of these uh, of all of these states that that's the, that gives you the total number of uh, particles uh, in, in the system. And these uh, e the sing these single particle states, they uh, they. Uh, we can we can think of creating or destroying these single particle states through what are called uh, annihilation and creation operators. So um, uh, for fermions, um, we can write our, our annihilation uh, creation annihilation operators as CIs and CJs. So uh, but we just the, without the dagger, that's that would be an annihilation operator, and with with the dagger, that's a that's a, a, a creation operator, and. Um, and they, for fermions, they follow uh, anti-commutation relations. So this is uh, this would be like CI, CJ, CI, CJ plus CJ, CI. Um, and then for bosons, they just follow the regular commutation relations, uh, uh, you know, BI, BJ minus BJ, uh, BI. So anyway, so we can write, we can write, uh, we can write annihilation and create creation operators for our for our single particle states. Uh, and uh, we can write the original Hamiltonian uh, in terms of these uh, that we were that we looked at when we talked about first quantization in terms of creation and annihilation operators. So, uh, so we, this this is again our Hamiltonian that we had uh, when we were talking about first quantization. And now we when we write this in terms of creation and annihilation operators, uh, we get something that looks like uh, the second line here, where uh, you notice that that uh, we have uh, two things here of the um, uh, the the Hamiltonian uh, being um, the expectation of a Hamiltonian between single particle between uh, states. So here it's the third line. We have the uh, single particle states, or uh, you know here we have uh, you know two uh, basically two particle states being sandwiched. The Hamiltonian is being sandwiched between two um, uh, single particle states, and we uh, uh, and 
we can we can take the find the expectation of the Hamiltonian. Uh, this actually, yeah, this is a, this is a typo. This should be a V here uh, instead of an H. Um, but anyways, you can see that that's how we can write down our, our Hamiltonian in terms of these creation and annihilation operators. And you know, these phi i and phi j's, these are single particle. Uh, these are our single particle wave functions. So this is how we can define these expectation values in our in our Hamiltonian. Okay, so from here we can now we can then form field operators uh, from a linear combination of these annihilation and creation operators, um, and so we're going to call these field operators psi and psi dagger, and they're defined uh, respectively uh, with respect to phi and phi dagger, and uh, these will these psi and psi daggers they will they will obey certain uh, commutation or anti commutation relations depending on if we're uh, talking about bosons or fermions. So if we're talking about uh, fermions, then uh, basically the, the, this plus minus just refers to the fermion or, or boson. So if, uh, if we're talking about fermions, then we're considering this, this will become the, the anti the anti bracket or the anti commutation relation. So we'll have psi uh, psi r psi r prime plus psi r prime psi psi r, and then if it's bosons, it will be minus. So the same thing, but uh, but minus. And then we can write down our Hamiltonian uh, in terms of of our uh, of these field operators, and uh, it looks like this this bottom line bottom line here. Okay, so this looks like the this Hamiltonian. This looks like the expectation value of the Hamiltonian taken between wave functions. I mean, that's basically uh, that's basically what it is. Uh, and in this way, quantum field theory allows us to avoid dealing with the many body wave function. Uh, entirely by enabling us to focus on the the on only the non-zero relevant uh, matrix elements. Okay, uh, so uh, so that was just a, a review, a brief review of first and second uh, quantization. Um, so uh, before I, I uh, I'll stop here if, if if people have any questions before I will before I dive into the uh, the canonical formulation of GR. Um, if it's okay with you, I think I lost track of what the H of R that we have in that expression above for the H hat. Um, oh, this H, this H here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is, um, yeah, so that's basically, so so this H of R, we're now saying that, uh, right, so we, we go from, uh, well, so what, what we're doing is uh, we're going from kind of this many body interpretation where so here we're saying uh, we can write it this H as a sum of individual uh, as, as some of individual particle Hamiltonians and now we're going to write our H our H in terms of this the second line here. Um, so what we're doing is we're going to be taking the expectation value of um, we're going to be taking the expectation value of our of our Hamiltonian between uh, a single single particle single particle wave functions, basically. So so this this h of this h of r i so this describes like um, this would be a single particle Hamiltonian. And so what what we do here is now we're just going to sandwich that for for various states of i and j. We just sandwich this h of r, right? And um, so now instead of writing it as R I R J, instead of writing these as individualized coordinates, we just write this as you know some generalized some general R, and then we just sandwich this between uh, our single particle wave functions. So that 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 will encode the uh, what before was kind of the dependence on the kind of each the location of each particle that now becomes becomes encoded in just these single particle wave functions, uh, you know I and J, and then. Hence these expectation values, and then when we do that, that's this kind of H that we end up here with here. I see. Okay. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, all right. So now I'm gonna uh, go talk about the uh, canonical formulation of uh, GR. So, uh, so first, I'm just gonna review what a canonical Formulation is, or you know, taking a theory and writing it in a canonical formulation. So something that you learn in in classical mechanics is that um, we can write down, uh, we can write a theory in terms of its uh, in terms of uh, canonical position and momentum variables. So this is uh, typically denoted the position variable would typically be de denoted as a Q, uh, and the momentum variables variables be denoted as P, and then and they satisfy this this 
this relation in their uh, what, what's called their Poisson brackets, where Poisson brackets are our uh, Poisson bracket between uh, any two uh, between F and G is is uh, defined as such, um, and the um, we can write down Hamilton's equations, which um, relate the, uh, the the time variation of these position and momentum variables in terms of the Poisson brackets of the position or momentum variable uh, with the uh, with the Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is something that we learn in in in, in, in classical mechanics, and then uh, in quantum mechanics, then we say, okay, now we're going to look at quantizing uh, the the quantizing our theory. So what we do is we promote our position and momentum variables to operators, uh, and when we do that, then these Poisson brackets, they are, they become uh, this, these, these brackets, these commutation relations. And now Q, Q and P are going to satisfy with what are called these commutation relations. Um, and now we can look at, uh, uh, we can look at, uh, uh, in, in quantum mechanics, we can look at a, a wave function that is in terms of our position variable Q. And we can look at what the action of uh, our position and momentum variables in terms of, um, uh, we can we can ask the relation of our position and momentum. The, uh, sorry, the action of our position and momentum operators on a spatial wave function, and what what, what does that do? Um, and so, there uh, for for the position and the momentum operators, they will have this these sort of uh, they will act on our spatial wave function in this way. And, uh, and then to look at the the, the dynamics of the system. We uh, can look at we look at uh, Schrodinger's equation. Uh, so we have we have a Hamiltonian that Hamiltonian get, itself gets promoted as an operator, and then we look at Schrodinger's equation for the time evolution of the system. Okay, so we're just so taking that kind of what we learn in, cl in classical and, and quantum mechanics, and um, now looking at how we would apply this to uh, to gravity to GR. So the canonical formulation of general relativity it, it's a, it's a Hamiltonian. Uh, formulation and uh what we do is we are going to so in, in general relativity in gr you have a, a space-time metric uh a metric that describes your your your, your space-time and we're going to decompose that so it's it's, it's four-dimensional uh in gr it's four-dimensional so we're going to decompose that by slicing uh our three plus one space-time into uh three-dimensional spatial hypersurfaces okay so what i'm writing here is we can see that we, we've got our uh we, we have basically our our, our Kind of our, our our metric here, and this is the way of describing uh, of defining our our norm, and uh, we're going to decompose that into a time time component, a space time component, and a, and a space space component. So uh, you, you see here in the in the dt squared in the time time component, we're going to introduce this capital N, which is called the elapsed function. Uh, we're going to introduce this beta, which is called the shift function, and we're going to have this gamma ij, which is a the, the spatial metric. Um, so just to give a pictorial representation of what these laps and shift functions are, so we can imagine, so this is, uh, we're imagining that we're taking our four dimensional space, our three plus one space time, and we're gonna, we're gonna slice it into these three dimensional hypersurfaces. So each one of these horizontal, these solid horizontal lines, this would be your, this would be a three dimensional uh, hypersurface at, uh, at some constant time. And then we have these, uh, we have these time-like vector fields that are the, these dashed lines. These vertical dash lines. So these would be like your time like vector fields. And so now we look at a time coordinate. Uh, and we we look we look at a, a bit, essentially a time evolution basically as, as moving along this time like vector field. And so we decompose our time coordinate into a part that is uh, perpendicular to the uh, these uh, these hyper, these three dimensional hypersurfaces. Uh, and a uh, component that is parallel to these these hypersurfaces, and a part that is perpendicular to these hypersurfaces. Um, this is uh, going to be the lapse function, the dot product of the, the of the of the lapse function capital N with the uh, unit normal vector uh, to the uh, to the to the hypersurface. Uh, so that's this this n this this n of the a here, and then uh, beta here. This is going to be the shift functions. So this is going to encode uh, motion. Uh, Tangential or uh, par parallel to the, the space-like slices. So, right now, mathematically, we basically we decompose our our time coordinate into a, uh, a part perpendicular to the hypersurface, which is uh, basically the shift function, and uh, the uh, part that's tangential or parallel, which is the uh, uh, 
sorry, yeah, the part perpendicular is a lapse function, the part parallel is or tangential is the shift function. Okay, so with uh with this three plus one decomposition uh of of our of our of our metric and gr, then the Einstein Hilbert action. Uh, so the Einstein Hilbert action that, that that's the action that describes gr. So it becomes something like this. Um Okay, so now uh, we have a so this this we 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 have a, this uh, spatial uh, curvature uh, in here this this R so that's with respect to your Riemannian metric and this these KIJs these are uh, these this is what's called the extrinsic curvature so we can write that in terms of uh, the, this the uh, basically the, the Lie differentiation on our spatial metric gamma so Lie differentiation on n which is just a unit normal to surfaces of, of constant uh, of constant time. And we can see that we, we introduce these. Uh, we have we have our lapse function in here. We have our covariant derivatives with respect to uh, these are with respect to the, the spatial metric, and uh, we've got the time derivative on our spatial metric. Uh, so that's the extrinsic curvature, and so this is what the Einstein-Hilbert act becomes. And uh, we can choose then uh, our our lapse and shift functions. Um, so right now, up to this point, the lapse and shift functions they've been totally uh, general, uh, but we can choose certain values for these lapse and shift functions, and what that amounts to is uh, it's a it's a choice of gauge so this 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 slicing this three demand the slicing of our space time into these hypersurfaces this is a uh it, it's a, it's a basically it's, it's a gauge uh to get a gauge choice uh when you when you fix when you fix a certain value for these lapses shift functions hence you choose a particular slicing um Okay, so uh, so if we set the last function equal to one and our, our, our shift function equal to uh, to zero, um, uh, our, what what we do is so uh, we uh, take this this uh, this de decomposed uh, this decomposed um, uh, action or Lagrangian, and we're going to uh, do a, a Legendre transform, and when we do that, we end up with a Hamiltonian, and then choosing you know uh, certain values for lapse and shift functions, we end up with the, with this Hamiltonian. Uh, in, in, in three dimensions, and uh, so again, we've got this Hamiltonian, uh, you know, this Hamiltonian density that's in terms of these uh, the spatial metric, uh, and then we've got these pi's, which are uh, this, these are the momenta conjugate to the spatial metric, and uh, we can recover Einstein's equations uh, so uh, via Poisson brackets with H. So this is similar to the uh, to what I uh, talked about uh, in the beginning in just when we're talking about just a canonic formulation it just in general and how we can write the the time the time derivative of either QRP in terms of you know the Poisson bracket with with Q uh, of Q with H so analogously here we can recover Einstein's equations uh, in GR via Poisson bracket with H uh, so now uh, we say, well, what if now, now we're going to seek to uh, promote uh, our, our classical Hamiltonian to an operator. So our, our Hamiltonian uh, operator is going to look something like this, where uh, this, this, these terms, this, this, per, these terms in parentheses, I, I uh, define that to be this capital G here, which is called the uh, the Wheeler DeWitt metric. Question? Uh, yes. Uh, so what is inside the three metric? Isn't that also the metric of the gamma, or is it? Uh, the three, you mean, uh, you talking about gamma? No, it, it's about the, the R, the last term. Oh, R, R. oh, R. So this is the, this is just, the, this is the three. Um, it's the scalar curvature, right? It's the scalar, the, yes, yes, yeah. Of gamma, is that right? Uh, of, of gamma, yes. Okay, so that has second derivatives in it, no? uh should yeah mm -hmm. yeah so is is that also going to be written in terms of pies and so on i mean or um so ultimately um well oh yeah so 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 ultimately what's going to happen is uh the the three, yeah. So the, the 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 spatial curvature will be will be written in terms of um, the the spatial curvature will be written in terms of the uh, it'll be written in terms of these uh, like canonical uh, like the spatial and 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 momentum uh, position and momentum pair. So to answer your question, uh, yes, uh, you can write it in terms of pi. I, I don't. I'm not going to show the like 
the expression here for like writing r in terms of pi but you can you can do that um the the other way of doing this is uh the other more common way i guess it's represented is instead of writing it directly in terms of the momentum contrary momentum you write in terms of the um the uh the the, the spin connection of gr so you write in terms of the so31 connection and when you write the spatial curvature then what happens is uh you take your so31 spin connection and you uh do a spatial projection of that uh and so this this 3d spatial projection of your so you can actually write this 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 curvature in terms of your uh okay in terms are you going to do this later so maybe i should wait just for uh i won't i won't quite uh, i won't I'll, I'll mention it at at, at the end of the talk okay. um yeah and basically what happens the reason is because uh you can rewrite r in terms of uh you can write rewrite r in terms of some new variables which i will mention but i won't show because that will be more okay. for the second talk yeah all right uh okay yeah so uh we have our uh we have our hamiltonian here that we uh just promoted to an operator and uh so again this is um our momentum conjugate to our spatial metric so that's uh what the spatial metric and the momentum uh that's what those are uh, as operators uh okay so the uh so what happens is that the these laps and shift functions so again something that i've kind of uh skipped over here but when you do this this Lejean, when you do this three plus one decomposition of your uh, of the einstein hilbert action that describes gr uh and you introduce these laps and shift functions uh what, what ends up happening is that they they uh they uh, they enter in they effectively become lagrange multipliers uh so when you when you vary the the uh, the action with respect to those uh you're going to get uh, constraints so uh, there there are two sets of constraints uh, that uh that arise so the first are called primary constraints which they're basically just that the momenta vanish on and off shell uh and basically just on and off shell is just a fancy way of saying um like on shells whether they satisfy the classical equation of motion and off shell they don't um and so we have additional so we have these primary constraints where the momenta vanish uh we get these additional on shell constraints that are called secondary uh, secondary constraints uh and uh you'll notice uh, the one on the left here is that that h is equal to zero um and this is uh this is uh the this is, uh, becomes the the wheeler dewitt uh, this is how the wheeler dewitt equation arises so the wheeler dewitt equation is uh an, includes the quantum dynamics of uh, of our system in 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 an analogous way uh to the schrodinger equation um uh, except that our time is now unphysical so basically the the, the uh, our the analogy to the schrodinger equation the wheeler dewitt equation uh now looks something like this um so so h ha, so h our hamiltonian uh, that describes gr acting on some some quantum state we're going to call psi uh is equal to zero um so the so right so so okay so what so what have we done we've taken gr we've written it in terms of in, in its hamiltonian formulation and now uh we're we seek to uh write we seek to look at the the the, the quantum dynamics of the system the way that the system evolved and the way that we do that is by looking at what's called this wheeler dewitt equation can I um, ask a brief question about the kind of like, so so we have these, um, we have this gamma and this pi that we've promoted to operators. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And on the last slide, you you wrote down what those operators are. In particular, yeah. you wrote down pi. Yeah. Um, so the fact that pi is given by taking a variation with respect to this three metric, mm -hmm. um, does that mean that our like wave function space, in other words, the space that our operators are acting on, mm -hmm. are those functionals of the three metric gamma? Yeah, uh, uh, yes. So yes, yes. So this wave function is going to become a, uh, it's going to become a functional of the, of the space of the spatial metric, yes. And like we, the idea is we want to be able to say like maybe the magnitude squared of psi in some sense is like a probability density for the three metric, yeah. Like the the, the set of all things that that gamma can be. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. So that's that's what we want. That's what we want to be able to do. Uh, I'm, I'm as I'm about to explain that. Uh, yeah, uh, it turns out you can't actually really uh, in 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 metric variables. Uh, it turns out you can't actually really. Uh, do that uh, but that's something that that the idea is that you 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 have this quantum state and you can you know basically you, you can you can define some 
some some probability density with of that and that would you can then you know that'd be related to you know your spatial metric uh so i that's like the the idea kind of that, especially like when this was first formulated it uh you know that that was the i that was the idea you know originally Okay, so okay, we have our Wheeler, Wheeler DeWitt equation here, and uh, so now I'm gonna talk about this Wheeler DeWitt equation and uh, the Ashtakar formalism. So, um, okay, so again, here's just the, the Wheeler DeWitt equation again. So we've got our Hamiltonian constraint and quantized uh, GR, uh, and the psi. Uh, this is a, a wave function that um, uh, this was termed, this was coined uh, the wave function of the so-called wave function of the universe. Uh, and uh, the original uh, authors of this, uh, Hartle and, and, and Hawking back in, in the mid 80s, they were they were the first ones to um, uh, solve this. They were the first ones to look at this uh, this wave function of the universe uh, in the context of the, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, Wheeler DeWitt equation. So, uh, so this Wheeler, uh, this Wheeler DeWitt equation is a functional differential equation on the space of three spatial metrics. Um, and so the thing to note about this, this, this quantum state, this wave function size that it's no longer, uh, it's, it's no longer a spatial wave function. So it's not, it's not a wave function that you, in the sense of like what you learn in quantum mechanics, where you have, you know, you have a wave function that's, you know, defined on some, that's defined, um, on like some Hilbert space. And then you can take, uh, you can basically take the norm, the norm squared of that. And that equals, that's, uh, gives you unity. Um, so this psi here is no, it's not a spatial wave function in that sense. Like you don't define this quantum state psi, uh, on like one of these three-dimensional hypersurfaces in one of these space-like slices that we made here. And then you take the norm squared of that and it, uh, and it equals one. So the psi is no longer a spatial wave function in that sense. What it is, is it's a functional of field configurations on all space time. And, uh, this, uh, this uh, this wave function, this quantum state, contains all of the information about the geometry and matter content of the universe. Uh, and so our Hamiltonian still acts on a Hilbert space, but because the uh, because our time coordinate is no uh, because our time coordinate is uh, not physical, it uh, no longer determines or our Hamiltonian no longer determines the uh, the evolution of the system. Um, okay, so we have our uh, Wheeler DeWitt equation, and this itself was a was a big uh, was this itself was a was a was a major breakthrough. Um, uh, this was first written down in 1967, um, uh, and this was written down by uh, you know by DeWitt, so hence the why it's called the uh, the Wheeler DeWitt equation. But um, so this was a major breakthrough when it went when when it was written down initially. Uh, and this was kind of a way of saying, um, th th this is a way of formulating a potentially, um, a, a theory of, of quantum gravity or a different way of, 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 of approaching the problem. Um, now the, the issue becomes that, uh, using metric variables, uh, when you, when you, when we're just using metric variables, uh, mathematically it's, it's, uh, very difficult to, uh write the hamiltonian as a well-defined operator when you're promoting it to uh when you're quantizing that um so this was uh this basically uh after the wheel the equation was first written down in the 60s it was uh basically because of this this math, math, mathematical difficulty there were a few decades of, of people people were just kind of, were just stuck on this um uh, and basically, it, it continued this way uh, for about 20 years until uh, Abby until Abby Ashtakar came along in 1986 and uh, introduced uh, uh, the this uh, new like this this new formalism uh, written in terms of what are called uh, Ashtakar variables. And uh, the Wheeler DeWitt equation uh, becomes uh, well defined when written in terms of these uh, Ashtakar variables, and this was something that. Um, Ted, Ted Jacobson and Lee Smolin realized in, in 1987, uh, so right after Ashokar introduced these variables. And um, so upon uh, restricting uh, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, so a reminder of the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, it's, it's a space, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a functional differential equation on the space of all possible uh, space-time metrics. 
so when you use these Ashtakar variables, the wheel to weight equation becomes well defined. Um, uh, still difficult to solve. It, it's still difficult mathematically to 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 just to solve that uh, exactly. But uh, what one can do is one can restrict the uh, the functional the functional space of of all possible space time metrics that you can restrict the Wheeler-DeWitt equation to uh, just homogeneous and isotropic uh, metrics. Uh, so another way of thinking of this is that you can restrict yourself to uh, you know F F L R W cosmology. Um, so that's just the the, the standard. Um, Kind of metric for describing cosmology for for uh, those who are unfamiliar with with what that is, uh, and when you do this, the Wheeler DeWitt equation, um, when you make this uh, this uh, restriction on, on the on your space metrics, the Wheeler DeWitt equation mathematically um, becomes a, a lot easier to to solve exactly this differential equation, uh, and it and and this is something that that can this that can be done and was done. Uh, and the solution is known as the Kodama state. Uh, and this was first written down by, by Hideo Kodama in 1990. Um, so this is uh, really the, this Kodama state uh, is uh, the work that my PhD advisor and I did uh, and our and our collaborator was building off. Uh, it was basically looking at this, co this, 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 this Kodama state. And this Kodama state is written in terms of the, the, these Ashtakar variables. And uh, so next time I'm going to talk more specifically about the, the Kodama state and uh, how the Ashtakar variables can be used to uh, simplify the, um, the, the canonical uh, formulation of, of general relativity. Um, okay, so uh, with that, I'm just going to kind of, uh, kind of conclude the kind of the intro, uh, I'll kind of conclude this talk and uh, I'll give a preview of the, of the next, the next talk I'll be giving in the spring, which will be, uh, uh, which will be, um, Focusing more on on the work that uh, focusing on the, on the work that we did uh, relating to this Kodama state. Okay, so as I, as I talked about, so we have first and second quantizations. This allow us to form for, allow us to formulate a theory of quantum mechanics and quantum fields, and uh, this is important because uh, we this is important for you know for looking at a theory that we may want to quantize, such as general relativity. Uh, and uh, we say the theory of, of the canonical formulation of, of, of general relativity is a, is a Hamiltonian. Um, it's a Hamiltonian treatment where the theory is written in terms of uh, the of position and, and conjugate momentum. So the, the spatial metric is acting as our position. Uh, it's acting as as our as our position variable. Okay, so then uh, when, upon decomposing our Einstein-Hilbert action into uh, uh, three plus one dimensions, we find that the Hamiltonian must satisfy a number of constraints, including the the including the the one that uh, including h equals zero, which that corresponds to the Will, that the Wheeler DeWitt equation. Uh, so that that is analog that it, it's analogous to the Schrodinger equation equation that in, in, it encodes the quantum dynamics of the system and the Will DeWitt equation uh, seeks to find a wave function that is annihilated by the Hamilton. The, uh, so the Will DeWitt equation is not, uh, it's not well defined in metric variables, um, but it becomes a uh, well-defined, uh, becomes a well-defined uh, differential equation by introducing these, uh, what are called these Ashtakar variables and, um, and rewriting GR in, in using this formalism. Um, okay, so that is, uh, with that, I will conclude uh, today's talk. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, if you have more questions, I will be happy to uh, answer them. <laughs>